appreciate you joining us here on, on Sunday Brunch. I'm delighted that we have a wonderful guest in the studio today, Brock Cordero uh, from Dartmouth. Brock uh, works on the Sheriff's Department. He is uh, very much involved not only in politics but in some important community activities as well. And so I want to touch on that. Then we're going to get into the politics of it. But, Brock, let's, I want to talk a little bit about your involvement and how people get, get involved in the fight against cancer. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. The, uh, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, certainly we can talk some politics, but I'm also excited to talk uh, about cancer. And I know uh, you've been talking quite a bit about it uh, as I was at home and driving in today. And um, it's certainly a subject I've had, unfortunately, uh, far too much uh, personal experience with. My uh, father actually died on uh, March 30th, 2014, uh, due to pancreatic cancer. He was treated for uh, lung cancer before that. Uh, and those are two of the top three cancers in the, uni- in the United States. So, uh, and certainly other members of my family, especially on my f- dad's side, have fought the battle. So uh, I've gotten, uh, in addition to the partisan uh, fights that I tend to get into, I've gotten to the nonpartisan world of uh, anti-cancer advocacy. And so uh, it's, uh, it's a well-timed topic <laughs> to have yeah. you today. Thank you. Yeah, it is. It is. And um, you have been involved uh, in politics for quite a while, and this dovetails with it because a lot of the medical is the political. Mm-hmm. Talk a little bit about, we've been talking about the opioid crisis, deaths here in Massachusetts, and we're talking about the fact that some people believe that doctors are being restricted from giving life, uh, life-affirming life cancer treatments in the form of opiates that relieve people of their pain. Talk a little bit about that, because you had an interesting perspective on Governor Baker's bill. Oh, absolutely. And I I do want to say that, you know, everyone kind of knows of the American Cancer Society and the great work they do, but I'm a volunteer both of of two other organizations, the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, as well as the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. And I mention that because while the names are very similar, and certainly with the American Cancer Society, ACS and ACS CAN, there's a great degree of overlap. ACS CAN is the legislative lobbying wing. That's the advocacy group to try to affect uh, cancer care through legislation. And I just wanted to stress that because everyone thinks might think of the American Cancer Society, but they're, they are prohibited from the political work, and that's where I'm involved in is in that, that aspect. But, no, absolutely. My, my, my father actually had been on uh, uh, oxy, uh, cotton oxycodone for many years due to a back problem unrelated to cancer, but his, he had a congenital issue. Uh, quite frankly, his spine was not connected to his hips. Uh, and he discovered that problem while as a truck driver in the fishing industry here in New Bedford uh, back around uh, the year 2000. And from 2000 to 2014, he was being treated for the chronic back problem with with the responsible use of opioids through you know, doctor uh, doctor's care and pain management. Uh, but the you know his doctor had the philosophy back in 2000 of uh, we're going to put you on these uh, on these medications. And yes, you will become addicted, but quite frankly, your ability to function going forward is necess- uh, necessitates the use of these drugs, and we'll worry about getting you off them if and when surgery was successful or what have you. And surgery was not successful. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I've. Uh, that's but he couldn't have lived a functioning life without them. Absolutely not. Right. I mean, even with them, it was extremely challenging, but without them, it was uh, impossible. And so this particular aspect of the opioid crisis is very important to me because. Um, what I have been terrified of is to see those in legitimate need of pain management through the use of opioids falling through the cracks and being neglected. Uh, actually, I had an exchange on Facebook one day with uh, a local police department who was cheering Governor Baker's legislation uh, to curb opioid abuse. And not that they were wrong, uh, but from my perspective, you know, I was afraid that the legislation would, the, would be too broad too much of a broad brush, and have those chronic pain sufferers fall through the cracks, especially those who are suffering from the chronic pain of cancer. Um, As a volunteer activist with the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, I can attest that that concern is shared by the organization nationwide as as we fight the opioid crisis. And just about a month or a month and a half ago, I was at a uh, New England advocacy summit where this question came up. And ultimately... Uh, while perhaps not a perfect, um, a perfect union here, uh, it, the consensus was that you know, the governor's proposals were uh, sensitive uh, to the chronic pain needs, 
but it's still something that uh, I think we need to keep an eye on because I'm firmly convinced that there are those who are suffering debilitating cancers and other diseases who may not uh, and, and are very likely not getting the full and adequate pain management treatment that they need and that they deserve due to an overabundance of, uh, of the fear of government regulation and oversight. Yeah, no, I was at the pharmacy one day and a gentleman in front of me, uh, they couldn't fill his prescriptions. And as I looked at the guy, I realized this guy's obviously suffering from cancer. He's in real rough shape. Uh, and the pharmacist was able to get it through. But the pharmacist was pointing out to him that, you know, because this is an ongoing problem for them. This is just at the start of it. They said, well, this, this doctor has prescribed too many opiates, and so they're shutting down everything going forward for this period of time. They were able to get the guy's prescriptions, but it, it seemed like a lot of hassle. So, so that's good. They think that, that Governor Baker's legislation is pretty good for, from the advocates for people who are in pain, but it is something to watch. It's certainly a, an imperfect balance, but a balance that is being sensitive to the needs of those chronic pain sufferers. I actually, uh, you know, I do know some of uh, the governor's uh, staffers in various uh, agencies, and I had lengthy conversations with them about this very issue. And my fears were, uh, I won't say put the rest entirely, but certainly leave – um, that uh, the administration was being sensitive. But just going back, you know, with my father, uh, granted, you know, we're talking March 2014, so maybe not the most recent peak of the opioid crisis, but there were many a time where my father would go to the local uh, pharmacy where he'd been getting his, uh, his prescriptions for many years. It was, and he would, they wouldn't have them. He'd have to wait several days in misery. Really? Waiting to have those prescriptions filled because of the regulations of how many pills for how many days, uh, uh, whether the prescription was the prescription written appropriately, and whatever technicalities they had. He would go several days in misery without the necessary uh, prescribed opioids because of the regulations then. And now we're heaping more on top of that. So that is why I'm particularly sensitive to, the, to this uh, uh, aspect of the issue. Well, no, I appreciate you sharing that with us, uh, Brock. Now, let's transition here. We're going to get a little bit more political, but we're sticking with cancer and with opioid abuse. So I had set this up. We've been talking about the, the bill that Barack Obama and Joe Biden and the Republicans wanted to pass. It would have given relief to cancer. There's some opiate piece in there. There's other stuff. And that Liz Warren attempted to filibuster that. You know a little bit more about it because you're involved in, in the cancer c- community and that bill. Share something with us. Well, what you're referring to is the 21st Century Cures Act. It passed uh, the Senate overwhelmingly in a bipartisan fe- uh, manner, uh, 94 to 5. All five were Democrats. The ringleader was Elizabeth Warren. She she attacked this bill vociferously. She uh, It was, to me, rather disgraceful. It's uh, To put it in perspective, this was the largest uh, overhaul of health care since the Affordable Care Act, since Obamacare. Uh, it included several pieces of very important uh, legislation, such as the Brain Initiative, funding for the National Institutes of Health, and from my perspective, uh, particularly the Precision Medicine Initiative and the what was ultimately called the Bo Biden Cancer Moonshot. Uh, the moonshot, as uh, your listeners may recall, was actually a, a part of President Obama's last State of the Union address. It was uh, his goal to fund cancer for the next 10 years, to fund cancer research. Uh, and for those of you folks who don't realize, Bo Biden was Joe Biden's son who died of cancer. Absolutely, he died of brain cancer. Died of brain cancer. Um, and this uh, this bill, which enjoyed bipartisan support in both houses, passed overwhelmingly, signed into law at the very end of Obama's administration, uh, was an instance where Elizabeth Warren, when given the opportunity to stand up and deliver for her constituents in a matter of literal life and death, for cancer, for opioids, for uh, traumatic brain injuries and other brain diseases and, and, and other research, um, she failed. She, as far as I'm concerned, and, and I am, I am, I obviously I'm a political uh, animal, I'm a Republican activist, but I, I try to be very nonpartisan, nonpolitical when it comes to uh, cancer issues. Um, she failed because she, in uh, my estimation, she put her own political future in her grandstanding ahead of what was right for the people of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in the, in the United States. Um, she let the perfect become the enemy of the good. Her perception of the perfect. She wanted maybe she wanted some more funding. That maybe she wanted she raged against um, uh, what she saw was giveaways to, ph- to big pharmaceuticals. I understand that, but when push came to shove, the vote was ninety four to five, and she chose to do nothing over funding cancer, opioid, 
brain and other vital medical research. It's really quite fascinating because we've mentioned this before, but it's really worth going over again. The Obama's people went to Governor Baker to try to stop what Liz Warren was doing and her growing influence in the Democratic Party. And they went so far as to leak the story to the Boston Globe, which felt very comfortable running the story, Mm -hmm. that Liz Warren was an obstructionist on this bill and that that, uh, President Obama had to go to Republican Governor Charlie Baker to try to preserve what was really a very important bill for his his administration. Well, absolutely. And and Governor Baker has been a, a real friend to the cancer community. Uh, you may notice every about once a year he gets his head shaved for a, a cancer right. cause. Uh, he's donated, I know personally he's donated money from his own pocket to cancer charities. Uh, his uh, inauguration day he was wearing one of my purple pan can uh, bracelets uh, at the inaugural balls. Uh, and that's just a small thing. Matter of fact, uh, just uh, no- November 17th he proclaimed pink, uh, the day Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Day in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And some of that sounds like minutia, but I mention it because when pancreatic cancer activists went to Washington, D.C., June of last year, I believe it was June 21st, we s- about 20 of us or so went to uh, Elizabeth Warren's office, met with her staffer, and Elizabeth Warren's staffer, Ashley Columbe, uh, legislative aid and special assistant, was very nice. He met with us and we heard our concerns. Many of those concerns were actually in the 21st Century Cures Act, uh, which Warren did not support. But when we asked her, for example, just a simple thing, would you please join the Congressional Caucus on the Deadliest Cancers? Um, by the way, at the time, there was a whopping one Massachusetts legislator on that caucus, and it was uh, co-chair uh, 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 Joe Kennedy. Okay. Uh, now there's two, actually, our own congressman, and, our, and I will be bipartisan. Our own congressman, Bill Keating, later joined after I spoke at length with his staffer who met with us, uh, whose f- all, father also died of pancreatic cancer. Mm-hmm. But So now there's whopping two. Uh, on the uh, caucus. Uh, Senator Markey had pledged to join but has not yet fulfilled that pledge. But I mention this because her staffer sat there with us, 20-some-odd members of uh, Pancreatic Cancer Action Network's uh, Boston affiliate, and with a straight face told us, well, you know, uh, that's not really something that the senator does. That's more of a House thing. Of course, I have a whole list of you know senators who are members of that committee. But w- even when given the opportunity to take which is largely a symbolic action as a nod to those uh, fighting quote unquote the deadliest cancers, and those are cancers that have a five-year relative survival rate under fifty percent. Uh, pancreatic cancer actually is at nine percent. It just became nine percent. Uh, when given the opportunity, again, sh- her office punted, and, that, and that's why I don't mean to be partisan on health, these health issues. But her inaction does not match her rhetoric of being uh, a candidate for uh, and a senator for the people. Brock, let me, let me tighten that up for you for those folks at home that didn't understand or get exactly what you just said because it's shocking. It's unbelievable, quite frankly, not only that they rejected it but that the manner in which they did. So you and about 20 representatives of the Boston affiliate of the Cancer Action – Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. Pancreatic Can- Cancer Action Network – Went down to Washington or to Boston? Washington, D.C. Went down to Washington, D.C. on your own dime. Yes. And to lobby on behalf of cancer research. And you wanted a simple thing. Basically symbolic. Mm -hmm. You wanted her – well, symbolic unless you have cancer or someone in your family died from it, I guess. I have people in my family Mm -hmm. die from pancreatic cancer, as you do, your dear dad. Uh, You meet with her staffer. What was her name? Ashley Collinbay. Right, Ashley Collinbay. You meet with a staffer in Washington, and your request is, can you join the Deadliest Cancers Caucus? Mm-hmm. And her answer was, what? Well, you know, that's not really something that the senator does. That's more of a House thing. And I have six pages of caucus members, and there are several senators on that list. So it, it is a bicameral, bipartisan, really nonpartisan caucus, and even when, like I said, when given the opportunity to take a largely symbolic step, uh, they stepped away. Who, who is, who is, who is this person? I mean, I mean, who is she? The things that we hear out of Washington. Hey, if a Republican was doing this, Brock, we'd be doing the same thing, right? Well, absolutely, and and I've tried to reach uh, to be a to be nonpartisan on this matter, and I've celebrated uh, Bill Keating joining the caucus. Sure. I gave him a lot of credit. I. Young, uh, young Kennedy, too. He's, yeah, he's a, in there. Joe Kennedy is one of the four co-chairs. Uh, so as a Republican myself, I long believe that when it comes to cancer and other health issues, partisanship 
ends. Uh, you know, to kill cancer, uh, Parshish has to die on these matters. But when someone sits there with a straight face and tells me that's just not something the senator does, so condescending. Uh, that offends me. Oh, so condescending and ridiculous. Uh, just, just awful. Brock, that's that's real news uh, about what, what she did there, and I, I hope people at home take that into account. Um, you know, when they when they think about what Liz Warren does. Listen, we're going to take a break real quick here. We'll be back. You can reach us at 508-996-0500. We have Brock Cordero, who's from Dartmouth. He's in here talking a little bit about cancer. We're going to talk some more politics. They'll come back because Brock's on the Republican State Committee. We're going to hold his feet to the fire, folks, and ask him about wh- whether we're going to have a candidate against Liz Warren because we, we desperately, desperately need one. And this is Sunday Brunch, and I'm the host, Chris McCarthy, and I'm glad you're able to join us. If you'd like to speak with us, you can at 508-996-0500. My guest in studio uh, today and through the remainder of the hour is Brock Cordero. We're talking about cancer and really some just some unfortunate stuff uh, from Liz Warren's office. Um, and we can, we'll, you know, we'll, we're going to move on from that for a second here because it's just so crazy what I just heard about the way you you folks are treated by her staffer and your representative of everybody uh, whose family suffered from cancer and those who are going to suffer from cancer, whether they realize it or not. But, Brock, you're on the Republican State Committee. Let's talk about that. Uh, Let's go for it here. We have a U.S. senator who must have a challenger. National polls show that she's the only Democrat that couldn't beat Donald Trump. I don't know if I believe those that there aren't other Democrats, too. I don't believe, I think Trump is, I'm never sure on the numbers of Trump, but I'll tell you, it's not favorable for her. Not at all. That she can't beat him. But can we, can we in the Republican Party field a candidate to beat her? I fully expect that there will be a candidate and probably a primary uh, to, ha- uh, to face Elizabeth Warren. Uh, I don't know who those will be yet. I, uh, certainly names have been thrown around both on uh, the station, the newspapers and, and such. Uh Anything from Kurt Schilling uh, to uh, Jeff, State Representative Jeff Deal to, I know, Alan Waters is running to uh, uh, Sheriff Lou Evangelitis over in Worcester and, and others. Uh, Rick Green, former uh, state committee member, uh, businessman, head of Mass Fiscal. Uh, so I, I fully expect that there'll be a, a candidate, a, a strong, viable candidate, and maybe even a vigorous primary, and I'm looking forward to that. Let, let's run through the list of potential candidates, Brock, and mm-hmm. g- get your opinion on them. You, you're not, you haven't made a decision yet who you'll support. No, I have not. Okay. Is that something you can do as a state committee person in the primary? Oh, absolutely. Okay. The, the only limitation on endorsing a candidate in the, uh, in the primaries is that the chairman and our paid staff cannot endorse. That makes Any sense. individual, the 80 of us on the state committee, are fully allowed to make any personal endorsement and support who we wish. Uh, we're we're going to use a Boston Globe article uh, from the other day that Brock was good enough to bring in. It uh, lays out a number of the candidates, but you may have some other names to throw in there as well. So the first candidate is Jeff Deal. That I think this is alphabetical, so it's not – maybe not, though. But Jeff Deal is from the uh, the South Shore. He's from the Hanson. The Abington. Ha- Abington, area, that yeah. part of the world. Um, Rockland. He used to work here in New Bedford, though. He worked for Poyant Signs. Absolutely. He's a state representative. He – chaired Donald Trump's campaign uh, in the state of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Now, he did lose a state Senate race this past time around, special election. So that's a chink in the armor, but not necessarily because, you know, when you lose, you often learn more than when you win. True, and he's instrumental in the uh, tank the gas tax effort and quite quite, uh, strong in the grassroots activism. So, you know, we didn't see that state Senate uh, race go quite the way we'd have liked, but uh, uh, amongst our uh, state uh, legislative caucus, he is well poised for future uh, future races, and who knows, maybe this one as well. Excellent. And, of course, he had Brockton in that district. Very difficult. Exactly. The only good thing to come out of Brockton was Ken Pittman. <laughs> uh, no, I'm kidding. I love Brockton. Marvin Hagel was great, too. Um, but do you, So Jeff Deal has got good support, you think, on the state committee? I think he, I think he will. Um, now, keep in mind, the st- uh, state committee support, there's 80 of us. Uh, we pull the levers of, uh, of the machinery to make the process run. What's really going to matter is the city, town, and ward committee support, uh, the grassroots activist support, and I think he probably has an edge in that, uh, being that uh, while he's only only a state rep, uh, he's enjoyed uh, lar- some state, quite a bit of statewide support 
again, for his uh, involvement in tank the gas tax and other issues. Uh, so he probably has a leg up in that regard. The, the listeners here on WBSM certainly know him because he's a regular on the Howie Car Show. Absolutely. Uh, t- discussing first the tank the tax, uh, which was the keeping the gas tax from going up. Uh, he was very instrumental in that. That was a statewide organization. Yeah, yeah, repealing it, actually. Uh, uh, and as you've seen, uh, because of that success, uh, the legislature gave themselves an $18 million pay raise where it could not be uh, undone via the referendum process. Right. But, Cute. But I digress. Cute stuff. So Jeff Deal, interesting name, interesting candidate, um, and he would perhaps have good Washington D.C. Trump support, although that remains to be seen, because he did cha- he was out front early for he for was Donald one of Trump. the campaign co-chairs for Trump and a very early uh, advocate for uh, who is now our president. Another candidate who I think is is very uh, strong, Rick Green. Mm-hmm. Uh, go over a little bit about Rick Green for us. Rick uh, is, was a Longtime member of the state committee. He ran for state party chair, lost narrowly. Uh, he's a uh, self made uh, small, although I guess I don't know how small he actually is as a businessman. Uh, I think arguably one of the largest, if not the largest, like auto parts uh, retailer, online retailer in the country. I think they do like 100 million, yeah, 180 it, million in revenue or something like it, that. Absolutely. Big money. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not a small business perhaps, uh, but he's also. The, uh, the the head of the Mass Fiscal Alliance, which is a which amongst conservative uh, and Republican circles is a very well respected uh, uh, advocacy group for taxation and government spending, so uh, he would be very well positioned uh, again you know, on the state with the state committee support, but uh, also our activist support because he has uh, never been out of that activist game. He is continually involved uh, on those fiscal issues and very well respected on uh, all uh, corners of the party. Yeah, he's a Relatively young guy, uh, married. I think he's a few kids, at least one. Uh, but he's very successful. He's out of Pepperell, which is the North Shore. Um, he has he and his brother. This is interesting. He and his brother started an, an online auto parts retailer, and they. I don't know if they were the first ones to do it, but they would put the videos up and show you how to actually use the part to re- do the work yourself on your automobile. So you'd get the part, but you get the video as well. You could see that, so it'd show you what to do. And he did that while he was getting his MBA at the University of Virginia. So Thomas Jefferson's alma mater. I find Rick Green to be very, very impressive. He also, as you point out, has never fallen out of the activist community. He lost a very close race for state chair um, of the Republican Party and stayed involved. Yeah, absolutely. He uh, he finished the rest of his state committee term. He lost narrowly to the current uh, chairman, Kirsten Hughes. And uh, basically served as a almost a co-chair, I believe, as the title was. But he's uh, he's been in the daily grind of a, of conservative Republican activism, uh, and it never left. So uh, I would not be surprised if he does eventually put, uh, toss his uh, hat into the ring. Yeah, and he has that think tank, Massachusetts Fiscal Alliance, which has been, his, which has played in the rough and tumble politics of, of uh, state the state legislature. He's got Jim Rappaport on his board, who many people recognize as a longtime member of the Republican uh, Massachusetts Party. Former state party chair himself, former candidate for lieutenant governor, uh, certainly very well respected in uh, state party circles. Yeah, I, I think I'm not taking sides yet in this, but I th- I'm very impressed with Rick Green. Let's move on to someone who, eh, I love him as a baseball player, but I, I don't know, Brock. Well, let's talk about it. Kurt Schilling, Reds, former Red Sox pitcher, not a great businessman down in Rhode Island. Uh, the tw- Was it 41 Studios, 21 Studios, 21 Million Studios, <laughs> whatever it was, the uh, taxpayers of Rhode Island are not happy with it. That wasn't entirely his fault, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, uh, he'll still be tarred by it. Uh, yeah. You know, I guess Kurt is kind of my sentimental favorite just because, you know, he has the bloody sock. He won the World Series. Uh, I remember going back uh, several years ago, maybe six uh, years ago now, he was campaigning. I believe it was for Charlie Baker at the time. And I was supposed – I was actually asked to be in a kind of a rolling rally and on his bus. Okay. And I was so upset that I couldn't get the time off of work at the time. Come on, Tom wouldn't leave you the time off? I don't, actually, I'm not even sure if I was working for him at the time. Oh, okay. Uh, but I couldn't get the time off of work, so I had the then state party chair get me his autograph. Nice. Which, I, which uh, but so that he's my sentimental favorite. But for his, uh, well, let me ask you a question then, Brock. Would you vote for Oil Can Boyd if he was running? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think that um, I, I would think about that. All right, well. but no, I, I like Kurt. Uh, I like Kurt. Uh, certainly, he's a radio personality himself. Now. By the way, I know someone who did federal time with Oil Can Boyd. <laughs> but anyway, go ahead. Uh, but uh, I'm not quite sure if he's. I know he's tossed his name out there. Says his wife's. You know, c- kind of letting him consider it. I'm thinking that might be more of a pl- ploy and a play for his 
radio ambitions. Uh, he put his name in the primary again. My heart might be in it, but I don't know if my head could uh, could would be in it. Uh, just be not so much for his positions, but again the baggage from the studios and. Uh, um, he often does shoot from the hip, but then again, we've seen that's pretty popular nowadays. It's popular, but Trump did not win Massachusetts. This is true. Uh, also, we have Governor Baker at the top of the ticket, which we'll go into that in a little bit, too. But just your thoughts. You know the governor. Um, do you think that Kurt Schilling would be the time to can if Governor Baker would want to share the ticket with? I never want to put words in the mouth of His Excellency, but my gut tells me probably not. Yeah, I don't I don't think so. And I, I just think that Kurt has got too much baggage, and he's— also, he doesn't. I don't. I don't think he listens to people because there's no way his lawyers and his accountants would have allowed him to invest his entire future in that one that one software business. Yeah, absolutely. So it indicates to me that that if that if a guy like Brock Cordero or Chris McCarthy sat down with him, guys who've been involved in politics a long time, and said, "Well, you got to do X, Y, and Z," he wouldn't listen to us. Probably not. And uh, that's very difficult to win an election if you don't listen to the people that know how elections work. Agreed. Even the you know President Trump did have to listen to his advisors eventually, and you know Kelly and Conway kind of you know turned things around. So yeah, you, you do have to listen to your advisors. Uh, shooting from the hip and being that you know being that type is there is a seg- segment of the party that is, loves that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're also eleven percent of the state, right. and that and the percentage of those within that eleven percent is much smaller. So I don't know. I don't know how much that how well that will play. Uh, in a statewide campaign, uh, I don't know how much traction. As much as I love you, can you'll get out of a bloody sock? Right, right. Um, all right. This is a name that's very interesting to me. My look, my first candidate, my only tr- true candidate, really was Tommy Hod- Tom Hodgson. I want a sheriff Tom Hodgson to run. I pushed him on the Boston Herald Radio where, where I am. I, I pushed him here. He's not running. He loves his job. I think you agree with that. But we do have another sheriff in this race, possibly Lou Evangelistes. Evangelitis. Evangelitis, who's the Republican sheriff of Worcester County. You know the sheriffs. Yep. Give us give us a little bit of information. Uh, I've known Lou for a while. Uh, he's a former state rep himself. Uh, pretty conservative guy. He was one of uh, he was kind of that faction going back a few years ago when there was a whopping sixteen Republicans in the state house. Now I think there's thirty four uh, that voted against the current um, uh, the current min- minority leader. Uh, kind of figuring he would might uh, Brad Jones might be a little too willing to work with the uh, with the Democrats. But so he was on that other side, kind of the more the Je- – actually, the Jeff Deal, uh, the Jeff Deal, Sean O'Connell kind of right. mold. Uh, and who was part of that mold at the time was uh, uh, Karen Polito, our lieutenant governor. So he's, he's a pretty conservative guy. He's uh, done a couple terms now uh, up, uh, up as sheriff of Worcester County, which in and itself is, is an enclave of Republican activism. That's right. Very successful up there. Karen Polito's from there. Absolutely. Uh, so he's in a great district. He's in a great position where he's his term is six years, so he can run, win or lose. He's uh, he's still sheriff if he if, right. if, if he fails. He's not r- giving up his seat, uh, and he's ra- rather popular. So I he's I, also the only Republican taller than Charlie Baker. Probably. Uh, what is he like? He's, he's enormous guy. He, he is. Uh, I remember they used to introduce him as the center of the uh, s- states uh, of the Mass GOP basketball team. Nice. Uh, he. I'm not a small guy, but he makes me feel very tiny. Yeah. No. He's he's a very tall guy and a nice guy, and that's an interesting candidate because as a sitting elected official, he's proven he can get the votes. Yeah, um, absolutely. And he, I, th- I think he beat Guy Glotus, but I'm not sure if Guy had retired. I think th- I think that might have been a retirement. Oh no, Guy Glotus Glo- Glo- ran for lieutenant governor. Yeah. I went to school with Guy Glotus. I know Guy. He's a, he's a nut. I like him. He was the only Democrat member of the Republican College, the, the UMass Amherst Republican <laughs> College. He's the only Democrat member. His father was a state rep mm-hmm. at the time. But, um, but uh, you know, in fact, and also, Guy Glotus is the only – he and uh, he and the, uh, the woman from Roxbury, whose name escapes right now, Senator Wilkinson, they're the only two people who voted for Mark Montigny for, for uh, Senate president. Ah. Kind of an interesting group, it Mark, is. cobbled together, isn't it? It is. Uh, um, okay, now another candidate, uh, and we're talking with um, Republican State Committee member Brock Cordero from Dartmouth because he's got an insight here on what's going on. Another name, Gabriel Gomez. Now, we have not heard from Gabriel in a while. Gabe, Gabriel, he's a former Navy SEAL, and he ran for U.S. Senate uh, in the special election of 2013. What are, you th- what are your thoughts there? Um I don't know how – I haven't spoke to him in a while. Uh, I don't know quite what his ambitions would be here. Uh, I know he's definitely going to be coming from not a Trump perspective. Uh, he was 
within the party, he was uh, savaged a little bit for being uh, more on the moderate side of things. Uh, him and I disagreed on some social issues. Uh, but he, he, he's a, got a great resume as a former Navy SEAL and businessman. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I believe he's in the, he was in the investment world uh, after leaving uh, the Navy. Uh, I could see him mounting a, a credible effort. I think uh, he would... Uh, he has some crossover appeal because you're not going to be able to demonize him as the hard right Trump, you know, Tea mm -hmm. Party Republican. Uh, that, of course, cuts both ways because he can lose some activists that way. Right. Uh, but I, uh, he's certainly a name that I would not be surprised to see in the mix. It's just uh, uh, I haven't seen him making too many political uh, efforts in the past year or so. Any other names? Have you heard any other names out there? Uh, the only other name that really has come out, and he's been running you know, as hard as I guess he can, is Alan Waters. From the uh, Cape, right? He's from the Cape. Uh, he's the only one that I think, quite honestly, with no offense to him, is not a serious candidate. And I say that He's an uh, angry one, though. He's an, well, actually... Self-professed, angry conservative. But the funny thing is he came to Dartmouth uh, when he was running for... Uh, he was running for uh, in the primary against Mark Allegro uh, for the congressional seat. And he was the kind of the happy warrior at that point. So it's kind of a you know kind of an interesting pivot he's made. And the only reason I say I don't think he's quite serious is he's left the Republican Party at one point to run, in a, to, so we didn't have to run in the primary against Mark Allegro. Then he rejoined the Republican Party. So you know I'm a, I'm a Republican loyal, so that kind of uh, that, that, that sort of thing kind of bothers me. Absolutely. Hey, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back um, here on WBSM. And good afternoon. I am Chris McCarthy. You are listening to Sunday Brunch. And our guest is the very informative Republican State Committee man, Brock Cordero, who I appreciate you, you coming in with us, Brock. Brock represents uh, the greater New Bedford area. You, essentially, you represent the Senate district that is currently represented by Senator Mark Montigny. Exactly. It's the second Bristol Plymouth district, which is New Bedford, Dartmouth, Fairhaven, and Cushnet, and Metapoiset. All right. We talked about potential candidates, and you're going to keep us updated on that for the U.S. Senate and what's out there. Absolutely. Uh, your prediction is there'll probably be a couple candidates, and there could be a primary. I would not be surprised at all. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. I think that there's a lot going on, and you have to, you know this, but maybe the listeners don't realize there's about a million more people in Massachusetts who vote in a presidential election than vote in a non-presidential election, and it's much more geared towards a Republican electorate uh so that's gonna be interesting and of course charlie baker's gonna be on the top of the ticket what do you think so f he hasn't announced mm -hmm. do you think he will run for re-election i think that is the easiest bet in massachusetts politics right. he's been fundraising continuously uh crisscrossing the state uh i fully expect that governor baker will seek re-election that's that's not even a question for me is the Republican Party looking to field a full slate of legislative candidates to run with Charlie Baker, or is that not a priority? It's certainly a priority. Whether we'll achieve that, uh, that's unknown. I mean, we are always, you know, one of the roles in the state committee is to try to recruit candidates. For example, uh, just this past cycle, we had someone who was who contacted me, met with him, connected him with the state party, very interested in running for uh, the seat of Chris Markey. Ultimately, he didn't decide to run. Uh, just uh, this past week, I've had uh, some people approach me, very angry about the $18 million uh, pay raise, who are interested in running perhaps against Mark Montigny, if not, uh, if not Chris Markey, and certainly uh, perhaps um, Tony Cabral. So there are, there, are, there are recruitment efforts here locally, and there's recruitment efforts across the Commonwealth. Certainly, uh, people have approached me about, uh, is there going to be a candidate against Maura Healy, especially outraged at her uh, gun grabbing uh, um, overriding our Second Amendment rights, uh, so I fully expect there will be. There, there's always an, uh, a continual outreach. When I say continual, one of the I serve on, for example, I'm the chairman of the Issues Committee in the Mass State Party. However, there, I was a former member of the Candidates Committee, and that committee basically never ends. It's constantly trying to recruit candidates, constantly evaluating uh, the, the, the most winnable districts, where we should target. Uh, and so we are always looking to do the candidate recruitment. It never ends. Uh, by law, actually, the most the state party can actually help a candidate with is $3,000. 3000 in cash. 3000 in cash or in kind. Um, you can yeah. only do 3000 in kind as yep. well? So normally the candidate support uh, comes out from the state party as – uh, uh, like mailings and, and, and such. Mm -hmm. We provide trainings. We provide the, the you know the advice and consultation, uh, etc. But what 
we really need, and it has been, and it's uh, always difficult to do, is to build strong ward, town, and city committees because that funding is is virtually unlimited, uh, and that's where the where if you look at uh, um, some of the Worcester areas, mm-hmm. uh, you'll Marlboro, see Marlboro, Marlboro in particular does an exceedingly gr- wonderful job at funding candidates, not just in their area because they are a fundraising machine. Uh, matter of fact, they've uh, the Democrats have tried to pass. Uh, campaign finance regulation to neuter them, and it fails. Yeah. Yeah, the campaign finance reform, truthfully, folks, is is incumbent protection, regardless of the party. If you're in a Republican state, they'd be trying to do it to lock lock the Democrats out. We happen to live in a Republican-dominated legislative state. Never fall for that. Campaign finance stuff is just incumbent incumbent protection. Brock, here's my suspicions. Mm -hmm. I like Charlie Baker. Mm Mm-hmm. I know Charlie Baker a long time. I remember when he was admin and finance director uh, under uh, under Governor Weld. Looks to me like Charlie Baker, he was going along with this pay raise. He appeared with you know with Mike Rodericks, who I like, Mike, the senator from uh, the Fall River, where uh, Fall River Westport Lakeville area. He appeared at Mike's fundraiser the same week of the pay raise and the veto, and he appeared with over, Senator Rosenberg. Yeah, over at Bittersweet Farms. Yeah, over at Bittersweet Farms. So my question is, how does that hurt? Doesn't that hurt the Republican Party's attempt to recruit candidates? I don't think it hurts the recruitment efforts. It's certainly something, let's just be honest, I do not do. I have Democratic friends. I have unenrolled friends who run for whatever office, uh, partisan or not. I don't go to their events. Uh, I love you. You know, we'll have a beer or two, but uh, we're not having a beer or two at your event. Right. Uh, so, you know, uh, that's something where I disagree with uh, with Charlie on. Uh, but I don't think it hurts the recruitment efforts. But it certainly does ha- it does have a dampening effect on some of our activists. No doubt about it. I mean, uh, Charlie has that has the uh, kind of a charm offensive with the Democrats, uh, and I, I don't want to say he plays the good cop to the state party's bad cop, but effectively, that's often what it is. Uh, you know, so uh, I wouldn't have uh, I wouldn't have counseled uh, the governor to go to uh, Mike Rogers' event, and you know what, Mike Rogers is someone who who I'm working with right now on a nonpartisan uh, piece of legislation. Not a bad guy, but he's a Democrat, and I prefer not to do that sort of thing. But um, you know, so while I don't think it hurts recruitment, it it is. Uh, it is a temporary wet blanket, absolutely. Yeah, no, I like Mike Rodericks a lot. I think he, he, he's a good, good guy. I consider him a friend. I'm mm-hmm. fr- very friendly with Mark Montigny. I think he's a great guy, uh, but I can disagree with him on issues. Just when you're the governor, yeah, mm-hmm. I'll take the other side though. He has to work with those guys, absolutely. and traditionally they're not going anywhere. And so, it, it it's in the governor's interest if his choice is to stand next to a guy who's definitely not going to win mm-hmm. versus stand next to a guy who's definitely going to win it's probably in his it's definitely in his best interest to stand with the guy who's going to win regardless of the party no absolutely and i think that's where the governor's coming from uh, again he has a bit of a charm a charm offensive let's just be honest there are uh, 160 uh, representatives 40 senators uh, there's out of that there's roughly 34 rep- Republicans in the House and uh, five in the Senate, maybe six. Uh, he has to work with Democrats. This is Massachusetts. I mean, it's. Uh, I may not like the demographics. I'm obviously working the best I can to change that. Uh, but this is not Texas or the Virginias or the Dakotas. Uh, you got to play the cards you're dealt, and the governor, you know, has a hand, uh, a fistful of Democrats in his cards. So certainly understand why he why he does some of the things he does that maybe I wouldn't do. But again. Uh, let me be the bad cop to his good cop, and we'll we'll deal with that. And and in all honesty, we can't criticize Elizabeth Warren for being unable to get along with people, and then uh, applaud, you know, and, and then and then beg a Governor Baker to do the same thing, right? Well, absolutely. And, and like even myself, I mean, I was quite appreciative when Senator Mark Montigny, who I'm charged with finding someone to run against him and defeating him. Yeah, good luck. Uh, but you know, when I I had a, a rather bipartisan pancreatic cancer study commission bill. Uh, come up. Uh, actually, it was an amendment come before uh, the uh, come before the legislature in November of uh, 15, 16. Um, well, the reason I mentioned is he was my he was my Senate sponsor. Mm-hmm. We c- you can work with Democrats. Oh, absolutely. It's uh, it's not a blood feud, but um, there are certain lines that I think do need to be maintained. Personally, again, I don't go to 
Democrat or unenrolled uh, fundraising events. But uh, also, I'm not up there under the Golden Dome dealing with them day in and day out trying to pass legislation. Uh, Governor, uh, as he, I heard him say yesterday, he's uh, soft on people. He's hard on issues. Yeah. And perhaps that's a way of uh, getting things done effectively. You know, he looks to me like he's taking a book. You may be the older you get this is you hear this left often so i'll compliment you. you may be too young to remember the bill weld race of 94 or not you may not have been active yet you probably i wasn't too active okay. i I'm, I'm, a, I'm a you know i'm getting up there in age but i'm not quite there yet. right but I, you know i was involved back then and, and when bill weld ran for re-election in 94 against mark roosevelt his campaign co-chairs down here were democrats paul walsh mm-hmm. and uh david nelson and he, he, I, his parties were like a Democratic fundraiser mm-hmm. down here at the Century House. And he rolled over his opponents. And, and so my question is, do you think you weren't intimately involved at that time? Mm-hmm. But that looks to me like Charlie Baker, who was intimately involved with Weld. That looks like the playbook he's following. Do you, are you worried about any of these Democrats who so far uh, uh, presume to run against Charlie Baker? I do think that's his playbook. I mean, uh, Governor Weld is a huge influence in the, just the life of uh, Charlie Baker. Um, I'm always I'm always the eternal pessimist. I assume the worst. I, I I tell you a thousand ways why Charlie Baker should have lost last time and why he'll lose. You know, he could lose again. Right. That said, um, you know, the, the the candidates who are running out who either have ex- uh, tossed their hat in the ring or are expected to, I'm concerned. I'm not worried. I think uh, you know. The first act of the first act of uh, of the announce, of the recent announcement of um, matter of fact I forget his name uh, Jay Gonzalez Jay Gonzalez yes uh, Deval Patrick's advisor was to raise taxes please if you're going to run whether it's Seti Warren Jay Gonzalez you pick the Democrat please announce that you want to raise taxes especially after after the 18 million dollar p- uh, pay hike please uh, that uh, uh, the governor will run will I'm sure will run a reelection on that all day long and win. Yeah, I, I think said he, I think anyone is a Democrat state. Anyone could can possibly. It's like any given Sunday, something could come up. I think Baker's in pretty strong position. I would be concerned a little bit about Seti Warren, uh, but I think that so far so good for Charlie Baker. Uh, but listen, let's. We have a call that's been patiently waiting, and, and I appreciate that. So we're gonna we're gonna go to that caller. Good afternoon. Thank Democrat you for uh, holding your live on WBSM. Possibly, it's like any given Sunday, something could. come it was me. It was me in the background. That's what you heard. You were a great caller. I was a great caller. I was a great caller. That's how I ended up getting here. Uh, we're talking to Brock Cordero from Dartmouth, who's on the Republican State Committee. Uh, Brock, here's a question. Okay. I do I do uh, some stuff up in the Boston area as well. I had an opportunity to speak with Doug Rubin, who's a strategist, worked for Deval Patrick and Liz Warren. He thought it's possible that this pay raise issue, while it won't really help Republicans because he's yeah, he's not going to compliment the Republicans anyway, mm-hmm. but that it could bring out primary challenges within the Democratic Party mm-hmm. against folks who voted for that pay raise. Any thoughts on that? Any rumors on that? I would not be surprised at all. I mean, th- think of both the entrenched incumbents, especially locally, who have not had primary opponents uh, in decades or in many cases, uh, certainly not serious primary opponents, but think of statewide. There are a number of freshman Democrats whose first vote was to raise their own pay. Right. I mean, this is the gift that's going to keep on giving, I believe. I've seen it just locally where people who, uh, you know, they're politically active, but they're, they've never thought of putting their name on the ballot. And they've started calling me and stopping me at the store. You know, how can we stop this? How can we repeal it? Which, unfortunately, we can't. And... You know, you know what? I'm really serious about thinking of running for office, and how do I do that? Interesting, interesting. If someone is interested in contacting you, how could they do that, Brock? Uh, you can reach me personally. Uh, my my contact information is uh, pretty easily available, but I'll give it to you. It's uh, my telephone number is five zero eight nine seven nine eight nine three zero. Email address is b n cordero b n c o r d e i r o at gmail dot com, and I will gladly plug any Republican activist either into uh, how to work, navigate the state party, to talk to our political director, to, to talk about running, uh, to perhaps join the local war, town, or city committee, which is crucial, put the party building here at the local level. Uh, or just reach out, go through MassGOP.com and, and contact them that way directly, and, and they'll probably connect you to me. Right. The point is getting connected. Um, you, you know, we can, it's great to have an opinion. It's great to 
no offense, call talk radio, but unless you're really getting involved in the process uh, of, of recruiting and electing candidates, we're really not accomplishing anything. Let's go to the phones. Good afternoon. Thank you for holding your live on WBSM. Hello. Hello. Hello, you're on the air. Hello. Hi, hello. Brock. Yes. You know, what you were charged with with this coming senatorial election is to provide a candidate that can win. Now, I know that that's a motherhood, but for years the party put out candidates that were just candidates. For instance, that Joe Malone used to run against Ted Kennedy with no chance of winning, even though he was a great candidate. And then we had Jackie Robinson, who also was a good candidate, but really had no chance of winning. Mm -hmm. We cannot stand another six years of Elizabeth Warren being completely ineffective for the Commonwealth. Agreed. Uh, Now, as far as Jackie Robinson goes, um, I wasn't as involved, obviously, during the Joe Malone. But uh, one thing I want to... I want to address is the state party does not run anyone. The st- candidates run themselves mm-hmm. through the state party. And I say that because Jackie Robinson and, and everyone since was not necessarily recruited by the party. And really, the, well, the other thing I want to address is the mass GOP, we assist the Senate candidates, certainly, and anyone who wants to run against Warren, but the real funding and the real support is going to come from the National Republican Senatorial Committee. Right. And so, you know, the, R- uh, the Governor's Association, the National Republican Congressional Committee, the RNC, all have different spheres where they're the primary people, uh, the primary organizations. We are, the Mass GOP State Committee is really the state legislative and gubernatorial, uh, and, and certainly the, the municipal area. Good afternoon. You're live on WBSM. Thanks for holding. Uh, hey, uh, Barack, Barack, Barack Adero. Yes. Uh, do you, do you know that the Governor Baker had a, a fundraiser in uh, New Bedford a couple of weeks ago? Uh, I'm not aware of uh, Yeah, exactly. That's what the problem is. Mm-hmm. That's what the problem is. Uh, your, your own governor had a, a fundraiser mm-hmm. in New Bedford, and you didn't even attend it. You know, so you need to be ashamed of yourself. That's what you really uh, need to be. If I'm you know, not you're, notified you're by... You're part of the demise of the Republican Party in this area. We need, we need, we need someone strong-minded like Chris McCarthy to run that party. That's what we need. Well, you know, Have a nice day. You, know, you too, Chris is always welcome to pull his papers at the next presidential primary and run against me, or as is anyone else. I do, I live, I do live in your district, but I don't want your job. But, uh, but, but thank it, you, caller, for the for the for the compliment. I appreciate that. To, actually, to address that uh, for a second, I d- I'm not always quick. notified of his of the governor's fundraiser. Certainly, uh, that's, that's actually, a, we, we'll but it's actually a conversation I have had with the state party of having better notification of when the governor is around. Now, and, and that's been an ongoing thing with with Republican governors down here, and probably for Democrats, we just don't know about it. Brock, I want to thank you for coming thank in, this is Brock Cordero from. Dartmouth is on Republican uh, State Committee. I'm Chris McCarthy for Sunday Brunch. We'll be back here next Sunday uh, from 10 to 1. And this, will, this interview will be up online in a, in a little while on, on a WBSM YouTube site. Go to WBSM.com as well for all the latest news and updates. We're going to have the national news and uh, some other great programming throughout the day. Thanks again, Brock. Thanks for having me.